start, so welcome to the second lecture of the Science Lectures. We're pleased to again have Professor Jean-Pierre Denis, who will talk about directed varieties and genetic variables. Okay, so again, I would like to thank the lab department uh, for the invitation, uh, especially Jason Starr for taking care of me along this week. Uh, so today I will uh, explain the basic uh, geometry uh, behind uh, the study of hyperbolic algebraic varieties. Uh, so uh, the basic question is uh, to understand what uh, projective algebraic varieties uh, are uh, when uh, they are hyperbolic in the sense of Kobayashi. So first let me remind you uh, this concept. So uh, as yesterday, x will denote for the moment, a compact complex manifold. And then, uh, on the compact complex manifold, you introduce uh, the Kobayashi uh, metric. So let, let us pick a tangent vector at some point, x, and then you define kappa, small x of c, uh, as follows. So it's the infimum of positive numbers lambda such that uh, there exists a holomorphic map from the unit piece into x, which maps the origin to point x, and uh, such that the tangent is proportional to the given vector c here. And lambda f prime of zero is c. And then you, uh, you try to have the largest possible disk, so when uh, the largest when the derivative becomes larger, of course, you can take lambda to be smaller, and then you achieve the minimum. Uh, and then, of course, it's homogeneous, uh, complex homogeneous, so you get some kind of pseudo-infinitesimal metric on tangent vectors, so-called thin star metric, which might degenerate. Of course, this might be zero. Uh, the infimum might be zero if if uh, the derivative can be taken very large. And then you, you integrate this infinitesimal metric, and then you obtain a, a distance, or at least maybe a degenerate distance, semi-distance. And then you get the Kobayashi distance between two points by just integrating a long path and taking the infimum. So a thin star metric is simply a, a, a metric on each fiber uh, which satisfies this property, but you assume no, no convexity, uh, no, uh, no seminal inequality. Oh. Just, just this homogeneity condition. Oh, so this is a, a thin star metric. Of course, you, usually you will assume also some kind of uh, measurability with respect to x if you want something which is not completely weird. But, uh, so that one is. Uh, that one is uh, always uh, semi-continuous, so it's not that bad. Okay. Um, so, uh, now there is a very uh, useful uh, result, which is called the volume lemma, or the investment lemma. Or theorem. Uh, namely, that if you have a sequence, so if, if you get zero here in the infimum, if you get zero, it means that you have a sequence such that the derivative uh, goes to infinity. So assume, assume you have a sequence f mu from the unit disk to x such that, 
for some Hermitian metric on X, the norm of the derivatives go to infinity. So omega is a fixed Hermitian metric on X. And X, I repeat, X, yeah, this works only if X is compact. Uh, then you can uh, reparameterize. Then there exists a sequence of radii which goes to infinity. Uh, uh, there exists a, a holomorphic uh, transforms from uh, the unit disk from the, the, the disk of radius R u into the unit disk, which are given just by homographies, so say H u. So that when you compose here, uh, the, uh, the derivatives, uh, the, the sequence here, will converge uniformly on compact subsets to some G, which is an entire curve with the property that the derivative is everywhere less than 1. So this is a curve uh, defined on the whole of C. Of course, the radii increase. And the derivative of 0 is 1. All complex numbers. So the idea of this is very simple. Uh, first, of course, uh, when you have a, a map, you can uh, just make a dilation. So you define f widow of t to be uh, f of t divided by r. So if f is defined on the unit disk, then this new one now is defined on the disk of radius r. And of course, the derivative at 0 is just 1 over r, the derivative of f at 0. Therefore, if you just rescale by uh, the norm of the derivative, you make the derivative at the origin to be equal to 1. Okay, that's the first observation, the trivial observation. And then uh, the second idea is that you're going to uh, look here uh, not at uh, the norm with respect to the standard metric of the disk, but with respect to the point carry metric. So you look at the point carry, the point carry norm. Of, uh, of the differential so from uh, the tangent space to the disk here was Poincaré into uh, Tx with the given Hermitian metric omega so of course this norm is just 1 minus t squared times uh, F u prime of t maybe yes this and now of course this is invariant by uh, Möbius transformations of the disk and therefore you can always achieve this is zero on the boundary well if well, you can shrink a little bit so that this is bounded uh, so this is zero on the boundary and therefore, you, by compactness, you have a point inside the disk where this achieves the maximum. So you can take an homography in such a way that the maximum is achieved at zero. So, uh, take a homography, homography transform, and then you can assume This is maximum at zero.
uh, denote by R, R nu, this, uh, this value, and then you rescale to make uh, this maximum to be equal to 1. And then after you, you make the change, you get this. Okay, so this is the new map, so J nu that you obtain uh, after you make the transform. And then you obtain this. And then you know by assumption that this goes to infinity. Uh, and then, because the, the derivatives are uniformly bounded, essentially that this goes to 1, so uh, on every compact set this is essentially bounded by 1, and then by uh, compactness you extract the subsequence, which converges to the entire curve. So this is the proof. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, you easily conclude from this, uh, if you have foreign uh, theorem and definition, So if x is compact, the following properties are equivalent. So first property, uh, the Kobayashi infinitesimal metric is non-degenerate. Namely, it's larger than epsilon times c squared. Some epsilon. Uh, second, uh, the Kobayashi distance is non determinate. And I mean uh, it separate points. And three, that uh, does not exist entire curve. Morphic non constant. The fourth property that does not exist body curve. Uh, so curves which have bounded the limit. So all properties are equivalent, and in this case, uh, you say that x is hyperbolic in the sense of coverage. Uh, this is uh, then, uh, as you see, an analytic concept. So it might not be of the taste of the right two matters. So let me try to give a more algebraic view. So uh, we'll say that x is algebraically hyperbolic. Uh, so you're going to assume x projected. X protective. So X will be said to be algebraically hyperbolic if there exists epsilon positive such that for every curve, this algebraic curve in X, uh, the genus, the geometric genus, and they mean the genus of the normalization of the curve satisfies that 2g c bar minus 2 is larger than epsilon times the degree. So the degree measured with respect to any, uh, any embedding in protective space, any ample visor, whatever, any color form. It's a good so pick any color form. So. so the degree then is just the integral over the curve of omega. Okay, and then, uh, well, the expectation is that uh, this is equivalent to uh, Kobayashi hyperbolic. Uh, one, one fact is easy, so here, x Kobayashi hyperbolic implies algebraic hyperbolic. And 
conjecture mm, converts is true. What do you mean by the degree of C? The integral of the C of my name. Oh, oh. Uh, oh, excuse me, Taylor, okay. I assume as projective, so you can take <laughs> that Taylor, but, uh, well, if you are, if you, it's not even needed that X is protected for this definition. You can pick any Hermitian method here. And then the result will still be true. And you expect anyway that uh, the hyperbolicity implies projectivity. So if you make a stronger conjecture that algebraically uh, uh, hyperbolic in that sense, well, you might not have enough curves. No, no you, you really need. Uh, this direction is always true, but for this you need enough curves. Because you might take a generic torus and then you have no curves. It's true because empty. Can you say it in terms of current? Sorry? Can you say it in terms of current? Then you would have to replace all the curves by, by foliations, currents, uh, more complicated objects. So, okay. What's the idea of that? Uh, so uh, let me prove this. So I, this is very good. I, I, I won't give all details because otherwise uh, I will not be able to explain what I wanted to explain. But. So suppose it is not algebraically applicable. So not being, being not algebraically hyperbolic means that there exists a sequence of curves So that the ratio of uh, the Euler the minus the Euler characteristic divided by the degree tends to zero. So uh, if uh, you have an elliptic curve or a rational curve, then already you are not hyperbolic because uh, you, have, you have C or an elliptic curve in it, so it cannot be hyperbolic. So assume, assume that your sequence is by curves which are at least of genus 2. Otherwise, that's not to prove. Uh, then the degree is just the integral over the curve of omega. And then by uh, the gauss bonnet formula, this is the integral of the curvature. A curvature of the metric omega restricted to C. With correct sum and constants. Okay, but then uh, if the average goes to zero, it means that there is at least one point where this goes to zero. Um, now your, your so curves. The, the, the curves are, are closed. Right. Algebraic. Right. Yeah. X is compact. Okay, so you have, here you have the normalization map. But because the genus is at least two, so this is a non triangular curve, you have the universal cover as a disk. So you, you can write the curve as a disk, and this is the inclusion of a curve in X. Okay, so you get a sequence of maps, and now you can uh, change by uh, an automorphism of the disk so that you map zero onto that point P nu on the curve, which is a point where the ratio of the values here um, is, uh, is less than the average. This exists by the mean value theorem, so that the curvature at that point divided by uh, omega at that point tends to zero. But, but this is precisely related to the Kobayashi metric, and if you look, it means precisely the derivative, this quantity is just the inverse of the derivative of that map here at point P, which means that this derivative goes to infinity. I'm not so good at algebra, but let's see. This, a, this can be computed, it's a constant, it's two pi or something, divided by the norm of, of that map, say a G nu prime at point 
I, at the point zero here with respect to the metric omega. Also that way. Huh? Works also that way. <laughs> or positive, positive things. So, so here you compute, you, you take the point carré, well, you, you compute the uh, point, well, somehow the curvature, you compare with the area. And uh, so it shows that the, the curvature somehow is small compared to the, to the area. Uh, it means exactly that there's a point where the derivative is very high. If they all had a sign of the Okay, uh, maybe I trade a little bit here. You, you take point out. You compute the, uh, you, you use the Gauss body with respect to point out. So you apply, uh, here you put the area measure with respect to point out. But the curvature of point out. Which is proportional to right? it, it, uh, and minus sign, of course. It's minus the other characteristic. The point out metric, uh, of course, has negative curvature. So minus the point out metric. So you are, uh, you are comparing uh, something which has fixed time. So I, I, you, I, I was wrong computing with omega. You have to compute with the, the point line. So you are comparing, you are comparing omega with the point line. And now this is correct. Okay, I, I don't want to give you, it's very easy. Uh, so it's containing my sensible. So all the numbers on the bottom are positive. So everything is positive now, because you, you, you okay, take... Everything is positive, okay, fine. Okay. But the, the converse is a very, very hard uh, property, and uh, probably uh, almost, almost impossible to prove right now with current technology. So uh, the goal of... of uh, this lecture and the next lecture will be to investigate the green group conjecture. So, uh, pick X, projective enterprise variety, a general type. General type means that the chemical bundle is a big bundle. Big means that uh, the growth of sections of multiples is uh, large as possible. Uh, if you are an analyst, uh, it means that there exists a metric which possibly has poles to a singular emission metric. such that the curvature, it has poles. So you compute as a curve. So it's uh, minus i over 2 pi d d bar log h. And because there might be uh, poles here, uh, you, you really get a curve. But you require that as a current, this is uh, bounded away from zero. Strictly positive as a current. So it's larger than epsilon times a smooth metric, or some epsilon positive, and omega a Hermitian metric, or Keller metric on X. Okay. Then, under this condition, uh, the conjecture says that there should exist, then, there exists a proper algebraic variety y and x such that for every entire curve so I will not repeat but holomorphic non-constant uh, then it must lie entirely in this given algebraic locus. So there is a proper algebraic locus which contains all entire curves 
little bit. And uh, this is, uh, I will not say much about this, but uh, this is of considerable interest in number theory because there is an additional statement, which is uh, also a conjecture. So number theoretic uh, addition to this. So assume that x is defined over q. x is embedded in some projective space and defined by polynomials with a rational coefficient. Then uh, you look at the rational points and then uh, the conjecture is that the rational points will be contained in Y except for finite union. It's contained in Y union of finite set. Is Y also five over two? Or and the Y is the same Y as the, the Y which contains all But is uh, also the five over two? Sorry? Is Y also the five over two? Or over the number two? Probably. Probably. Probably you expect in that case that Y will be in final of some number. Well, maybe the statement is not, should be refined a bit. It's still so far away from being proved that uh, maybe the statement itself is not absolutely true. Right? Well, defining y to be the Zariski closure of all these polar curves is invariant under all of the Galois. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Well, if, you, if you take y, well, here you don't, don't specify y to be the minimal one. But if you take that one, it will be the minimal one, and it will be invariant by all the Galois actions and so on, so it should be the right. Um, but anyway, any larger will also satisfy. Why is it you can't act on why the Galois group until you know it's defined over another field? But you can't act on an algebraic curve. Well, you can act on an algebraic curve. Oh, these are the polar work. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, but, but also, yeah, but you will see that the, um, well, I will prove that. That actually the entire curve must satisfy uh, very strong algebraic conditions, which now are expected to be defined. So you, you will have a way of, of somehow showing that your entire curves are not as consonantal as you would expect at first. So this might answer the question. But as I said, the statement is not absolutely complete. Are some special so, cases of this known? Sorry? Are some special cases of this known? Uh, well, of course, uh, the special case of curves, uh, the notion of x is 1. Uh, is the main achievement of Felting's uh, the one uh, for which he got the fifth medal. So th this is the uh, proof that it, on a curve of uh, genus at least two, uh, you have only five too many points. Uh, this would be the generalization of the true dimension. Okay, so unfortunately, uh, I have little to say on the number theoretic uh, results. So I will concentrate on the geometry, and already you have to define this curve as well. So, um, until uh, last year, uh, essentially nothing was known about this. And last year, I was able to uh, prove the first step. So, uh, not proving uh, existence of algebraic equations, but at least algebraic differential equations. Uh, and then, uh, you would have to prove that there are sufficiently many di algebraic differential equations, so that you can eliminate the differentials and then prove that you get an algebraic equation by, uh, by having enough differential equations. Uh, the, the approach makes it uh, likely, but we still have to work a lot, and this is not yet good. Okay, so now I will introduce uh, techniques. If you have only, is it easy to show that if you have one curve, you will be contained in some proper subvariety, or even that's hard? That's Almost as, almost as hard. Mm. But there are indeed some cases where it's easier to find for each curve 
uh, y, which depends on f. This is called the weak frequency. I, I should also attribute to Lang the circle of ideas. Uh, Lang was more interested in number theoretic issues, but so uh, probably it should be called the Lang uh, Proving uh, the uh, y depending on f would be a, already a tremendous achievement. Is, is the point that you don't know much about the, the closure of the image? I mean, if you assume it's finite energy or something like that, right, then you have a little of singularity, right? So then it extends to P1 and... Oh, no, that doesn't have to close out or anything like that. Because that's what I'm asking. So, you know... No, that, I mean, in protective space, for instance, if you're on protective space, uh, if uh, a map from... See, protective space is just given by arbitrary uh, holomorphic maps. So, don't have common zeros, but anyway, even if they have common zeros, you can you can cancel the zeros. So, and then you get an arbitrary homomorphic map to protective space, and it, of course it can be dense. So just take exponentials with uh, uh, algebraically independent coefficients or linearly independent coefficients. It's enough. Uh, it can be dense in some uh, in some uh, real manifold. Uh, if you take exponentials with real coefficients. Uh, you will get something that might be might be dense, uh, uh, will be Zariski dense, but dense in the usual sense only in a real uh, subset. So it, it can be very weird. This So in higher higher dimension uh, situation, the extreme high. So there is another concept which I will not have time introduced, which is uh, volume hyperbolicity. So instead of, of measuring uh, vectors, you can measure p vectors. Uh, to do this, you look at maps from the, the p ball into x. So instead of looking at the unit disk in c, you look at the unit ball in cp. And then, uh, instead of measuring uh, infinitesimal Kobayashi metric for vectors, you look at p vectors. So you look at the determinant. And then uh, the conjecture, if you, you look at the volume, so you look at the maximal uh, n vectors, or n is dimension, then uh, you get volume hyperbolicity if and only if it is of general type. So for volume hyperbolicity, it should be equivalent to being of general type. Uh, of course, being of general type does not imply hyperbolic, for instance, uh, if, you, if you take the thermal, uh, the thermal hypersurfaces. So this is the Fermat hypersurface of degree D in Pn plus 1. Uh, it contains a lot of uh, rational curves because you only have to specify, for instance, Z1 is the root of unity times Z0, and then you, you cut by, by pairs of, of coordinates, and then you get uh, products of P1s containing this. Uh, so although uh, the degree can be arbitrarily large and it can be a general type, uh, it's still uh, still not hyperbolic. But it is expected that a generic generic member of high degree, so if you take D sufficiently large depending on dimension, which is even expected to be 2n plus 1, I guess. Let's see, uh, P3, well, it's a uh, Then, no, it's this one. Uh, then uh, a generic member here will be hyperbolic. Uh, this is very hard to prove. Uh, I proved in uh, 1999 uh, that this is true for surfaces in P3. So if you have a, a generic surface in P3 of degree at least 21, then it is hyperbolic. Um, so results which I will explain here prove uh, in this direction for higher degree. Uh, don't expect that. How do you produce the examples of hyperbolic? Well, <laughs> mm, there are examples produced by Alan Nagel, a student of in uh, 1990, by taking explicit uh, hypersurfaces defined by few normals. So you essentially, uh, you deform the Fermat hypersurface. You add epsilon times, for instance, uh, a suitable uh, product of. 
Okay. So let, let me now uh, introduce some techniques. So as, as I said, uh, the main technique is to introduce uh, differential equations. But uh, I want to work in a certain generality, so I want to generalize this, uh, this setting. So more generally, you are interested in following category. Category of directed manifolds. So in this setting, you consider pairs. So these are the objects where x is compact complex manifold, projective algebraic variety, and v is a subpanel of Tx or maybe a, a linear subspace. Analytic linear surface. By this, I mean that uh, it is a closed algebraic subset of the total space, space of Tx such that all fibers are vector subspaces, but they need not be of the same dimension. So it's a singular uh, vector, vector sum bundle. Okay, so this is algebraic or analytic depending on the setting. Closed. And then all fibers of vector subspaces. So these are the objects. And the morphisms, the morphisms are just maps between pairs in such a way that the differential of F takes V into W. Okay. Um, you don't assume any integrability of V, but of course uh, you don't exclude integrability either. So this of course includes uh, a relative situation so if you have a, a family, a formation, of course you can take as V uh, the relative uh, tangent bundle over the fibers. So it will include a uh, problem with the variation of parameters. But you can also assume V in the bubble, in which case you will have a foliation. But you also include the uh, case of arbitrary distribution of subspaces, so in a non integrable situation. All this is of interest. And now, uh, well, you have the concept of hyperbolic uh, pairs. So now you look at holomorphic curves. Like this. Uh, and C, I, I mean the, the pair uh, given by C and TC. So this means, in this setting, the morphism in this category from CTC to XB means simply a curve which is tangent to V. So the condition is that the derivative of F takes uh, TC into V. So you are looking at entire curves, entire curves tangent to V. And now uh, you will say by analogy that uh, if the pair is hyperbolic if you don't have entire curves which is equivalent to the, um, the Kobayashi metric on V uh, being non-degenerate, such as you can reproduce uh, all the, the proofs so the concept of a pair which is hyperbolic. This V is hyperbolic if, uh, so all properties which I declined, uh, which I gave are equivalent. So for instance, uh, if there are no uh, entire curve, Okay. Uh, now you have a generalization of the Bundle conjecture as well. So generalized long Bundle conjecture.
So take xv a pair and assume that uh, the canonical bundle of v is b. I will explain what it means. Then there should exist a proper algebraic variety y in x such that every entire curve tangent to v satisfies that f of c is contained in y. So now uh, I have to say what is kd. Of course, the absolute case just take V to be the full tangent bundle. So this means that you put no constraint on the tangents to the curve. Uh, and then in that case, the canonical bundle of V is just the, the canonical bundle of X. And the condition that this is big is the condition that X is of general type. But here you, you will include results on certain foliations, assuming some good properties of the canonical bundle of foliations, and you will have similar results. I don't understand the quote. You're saying this is the definition of the This is the definition of the absolute the absolute case you just take v equal tx and then the, the, the canonical bundle to, to, to v No, it's a notation. K oh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a notation. So you define kv. So I, I'm going to define kv. Actually kv, kv is a sheet. So kv, if, if v is a sub bundle, So if V is a sub bundle, KV is some, simply the determinant of this star. In general, denote by R the generic rank, the rank of G. So because it is a linear subspace, it has a generic rank, which is uh, the rank of the fibers on the size P of the But the rank may increase on special fibers. And then uh, you look. So uh, this, uh, you, you can make an invertible sheaf by looking at the bidule. Okay, so you can produce uh, holomorphic sections of that uh, E star, and you can take the value, so you make it a long bundle. But then you have to twist by multiplier ideal, which is obtained as follows. You take sections of T star X, and you take the image into lambda R of O of E star, and so you arrive here, so you arrive here in this, in this line bundle. So this is an invertible sheaf. Uh, uh, you take as an ideal everything that is generated by the term somehow R, R wedge products of linear forms of this dark case. So for instance, let me give you an example. So if you take V, B to be simply the line generated by point Z. So you are saying C3, you have 0 here, and you take V at point Z to be the line through point Z. When Z approaches 0, uh, these lines, of course, become dense in C3. So you, the fiber at 0, if you want it to be a closed magnetic set, you are forced to take V0 to be C3. But now if you take the dual, of course locally this is an invertible sheaf, it's a line generated by one element. But uh, in the dual, of course, 
Um, the, the sections uh, will, will have zero. So, uh, so this ideal uh, will introduce uh, functions which must vanish at the end. Okay, so you have, you have to take into account this ideal. And now, when I, uh, the definition that KV is big, you take a blow up so that you can you make this thing invertible, who is possible, and you say that the shift is big if after you make it a line below by blowing up, it becomes big. So this is, this is the sheet KD by definition. And you say it's big if after making it invertible, it is big in the standard sets. So now I've explained everything in the context. Uh, so now maybe just to raise your appetite, I can say theorem which I want to prove tomorrow. and k big then there exists a k jet bundle x k over x I will explain what are these k jet bundles and a proper algebraic variety in xk such that for every entire curve tangent to v then the k jet so you, you look at the Taylor expansion of the k of, of your curve it defines a k jet and then this k jet is contained in one So this, this means that there exists a, an a equivalent statement is to say that there exists an algebraic differential operator depending on the first k derivatives which is identically zero for all curves. There exists an equation, an algebraic differential equation of order k for all entire curves. Uh, K is some, uh, there exists some K. Uh, yes. Uh, so the theorem will give you a method of uh, computing. It can be extremely hard. To prove the full Gunn-Willis conjecture, you would need to have enough algebraic equations. So you have here the, the bundle case, which I will explain, and each each equation p defines a zero set. You look at those jets which satisfy the equation. So this defines a divisor, and for each equation you have a divisor, and then they will you will take the intersection of course all the equations you have, and then you get some algebraic set, so you have a U, and then the question is whether this W projects down to a proper algebraic variety in X. So somehow now the next question to be solved is to uh, the proof shows that you have many, many equations. You can count the number of equations somehow. 
proof depends on homomorphic morph inequalities, so you have a very precise count on a number of equations. But then the question is, uh, what is the base locus? Uh, you have to understand uh, more on the base locus and to show that this base locus projects on the base manifold into something which is uh, proper algebra algebraic. Okay, so I have a few minutes left, so I will explain now the uh, precise definitions. Uh, actually, very simple. So, uh, you look at uh, JK of V. This is, uh, by definition, K jets. Curves, jump of curves, which are tangent to V. So uh, you can write this, uh, so you have a parameter T, uh, and here you have a point X, so you, you, you put curves which map 0 uh, onto the given base point x. So in coordinates, it starts, so you fix coordinates, z1, zn. So in, that, in that, those coordinates, you can write the curve as an interval of holomorphic functions. And then you can look at the Taylor expansion. So it will start with x. And then uh, some coefficients, a1, t, plus a, k, t, k. And then you are going to neglect uh, the next step. So in case uh, V, in the absolute case, so if V is Tx, uh, this is just uh, a fiber bundle, such that the fibers, so the fibers are parameterized. by A1, AK, which are just elements in Cn times K. So uh, this is a, a, a fine, well, this is a, a bundle so that the fibers are affine spaces, but it's not an affine bundle because the transforms, when you change coordinates, uh, these are not affine transformations, are complicated transformations. If V is arbitrary, you can essentially do the same, but instead you are going to compute, uh, you take a connection, so a holomorphic connection, on, on V, at least at those points where it is a subbundle, so you, of course uh, you have to take a connection outside of the singularities, and then you are computing with respect to the connection, the successive derivative at the origin, and that because you have a connection on V here, you get points in V. And then uh, the fibers is simply V to the K. So it's isomorphic to CR to K. So it's again, uh, the fibers are affine spaces, but not even a fine structure. And then uh, you have a C star action here, which is very important. C star, and then you reparameterize your curve by changing the parameter to be lambda t. Therefore, of course, it is x plus lambda a1 t plus lambda to the k a k t the k. So you have a weighted, you have a weighted action uh, of weight. take the non-zero jets, so you remove, you remove uh, the 
constant jet here. And you take the quotient by C star. And then you get a fiber bundle such that the fibers are weighted projective spaces. So the fibers are weighted projective spaces. With, with that weight. Uh, this uh, we will denote as the Green Griffiths bundle of order K associated to V. So you should put a V somewhere. Okay. Uh, now, of course, uh, because of the construction, you have a sheaf O A scale of M which is the sheaf of polynomials of degree m with respect to this weight reduction. So you look at polynomials on, on the fibers locally, you have a trivialization. You look at polynomials in the coefficients. And you count the degree, but you count here of 1 here and k here, so the weighted degree. So this is the sheaf of sections which define polynomials of weighted degree m. It's uh, an invertible sheaf only when M is a multiple of the least common uh, multiple of 1 to K. Uh, if clearly, by definition, if you take the direct image of this, so you have a projection, and now if you take the direct image, of that sheaf onto x, then by definition uh, you get uh, the sheaf of differential operators, which are polynomials in the k first derivative. So this can be identified with the bundle which I will denote by E Green Griffiths Km. This is the bundle of course may have singularities. The bundle of algebraic differential operators. And these are precisely the operators which are defined on a curve as sum of some coefficients calculated uh, where the curve is. Uh, then you have uh, an algebraic dependence on the successive derivatives. And then the fact that you have a weighted degree m means precisely that the length of alpha 1 plus 2 times the length of alpha 2 plus etc. plus k times the alpha q is equal to m. So that uh, you can understand now the algebraic differential operators as sections of a line bundle. And the strategy is to apply polymorphic morph inequalities with this line bundle. So we have seen yesterday that we have a powerful technique of computing the cohomology groups and the sections of any line bundle in a very general situation. So we are going to apply more inequalities to these. In that way, produce uh, differential operators. And then we have to show that these differential operators uh, give solutions for the entire curve. So I think I'm already over time, so I will stop here. So I will have to prove the vanishing theorem, so that, that, that I have no time to do it today, so I will do it tomorrow. is not extremely sensitive to singularities because, I, as I explained yesterday, it's a question of volumes. Uh, uh, volumes are invariant by volume. Uh, therefore, uh, you can afford to have any singularities uh, may occur, and then you blow up to have non-singular models. Uh, it does not affect the volumes. The only thing is that you, you really have to take into account the meaning of singularities on V. This is very important because this affects 
the, the, the fact that you twist the canonical sheet by a certain ideal modifies the, the concept of bigness that, uh, that is used in, in the hypothesis. Uh, that has to be taken into account. But apart from that, uh, singularities are not. Important.